This program is made possible in part by a grant from Humanities Texas, the state affiliate of the National Endowment for the Humanities. And by the El Paso County Historical Commission. By Maury and Jean Kemp. And by Capstone Productions, Inc. Hello from the White House. Thanks for joining me for a look at Tom Lee's El Paso. My mother grew up in El Paso, and one of my happy childhood memories is taking the train from Midland to El Paso and seeing the silhouette of the Juarez Mountains and Mount Franklin with the lights of El Paso in the distance. In this program, Tom describes his experience growing up in El Paso and the places and people that gave meaning to his life, especially Mount Franklin and his father, Mayor Tom Lee Sr. Tom's painting, Rio Grande, has hung in the Oval Office for President Bush to see every day. This work of art shows Tom's love for his desert home and for the river that formed the Pass of the North. Tom Lee was a great artist, a great Texan, and for eight years his painting has provided a warm reminder of home. President Bush and I thank the city of El Paso for loaning Rio Grande to the White House. When we return to Texas, we look forward to seeing Tom's painting in the El Paso Museum of Art once again. And now, we'll hear from Tom in his own words. Here's Tom Lee's El Paso. Mother see that I was clean and looked nice and she could be proud of me and I could go I'd go and take the streetcar and go down town and see dad and sometimes he'd give me a quarter, sometimes a dime. And the the dime was to get home on and I'd just uh, go to the public library and when I was about eleven or twelve uh, I was in the library looking at the art books when Maud Sullivan, who was a great, great woman, she was the one that showed me all the art books. That was really hot stuff for me. I, I wanted to be an artist and from the very time I was a little bitty kid. And I had to go to the Carnegie Public Library there so it was on the site of just behind where the present Central Library is located on Oregon Street. And then across from the library on Oregon Street was the YMCA with the gymnasium and the swimming pool. And Dad gave me the money every year to belong to the YMCA, starting when I was a peewee in the peewee class and learned to swim when I was a little kid. And I'd get the books that Ms. Sullivan let me take from the library and leave them with the clerk there at the front desk of the YMCA and then go and have a swim and work in the, museum, in the gymnasium. And we did gymnastics and I took boxing lessons. And, uh, then I'd go out and wait for the streetcar and it'd go out Arizona Street, past Moorhead School, where students were known as dust people from Lamar as Moorhead and Less Brains, etc. Uh, we managed to have a very my brother Joe and I have a very happy life, lucky life. <laughs> Our parents loved us and helped us. 
So everything about El Paso when I was a youth interests me yet. And I wish I could dig it all up again. This is Tom Lee Park. It overlooks the neighborhood where Tom Lee grew up as a young boy during the turbulent years of the Mexican Revolution. His father was mayor of El Paso then, and Pancho Villa threatened to kill Mayor Lee and kidnap his two sons. That's one of the stories he tells in this rare TV conversation, recorded when he was 92 years old, a year before he died. It was a privilege to know and work with Tom Lee, and it is a privilege to share this conversation with you. Well, you know, I was thinking about what is the difference, the main sorts of differences from the time I was a kid. Let's talk about the time when I was from uh, 10 years old to 12, 13, 14, where I had some consciousness of what was going around me. I was thinking about how there were not many automobiles in those days. Uh, what we used was a streetcar. And uh, the streetcars had routes that took you to almost all the places that uh, all the districts of El Paso from, they had one, for instance, that went all the way out to the smelter and they had one that went all the way out to clear on this side of the mountain to Fort Bliss or <coughs> to the end of Dyer Street in those days, right at the gate uh, when Fort Bliss had only one gate. But uh, it was, I used the, the uh, you'd never think of, of moving around the, in those days with an automobile, except when your parents took you to church or on Sunday afternoons was a great time. Uh, even before the automobiles, why people would, uh, if they didn't own a buggy and a horse, why they would uh, hire a rig, they called it, and they'd go for a Sunday afternoon drive. And uh, you could get down a little bit past the Scarity Park <laughs> and back uh, in an afternoon without too much uh, difficulty. Uh, when, when you got a car, why I remember it was a seven passenger Buick. It had those uh, jump seats that my brother and I sat in, my dad and mother in the front. And uh, gosh, we went, we'd go down some Sundays on extensive Sunday afternoon drives where we'd uh, have some lemonade or something at the end of the trip down the, at one of dad's friends in Clint. <laughs> that was a big deal. And I remember our dad used to hire a buggy when I was a little bitty guy and an interesting thing uh, in that regard about horse-drawn vehicles the night that dad that they counted the votes and dad was uh, elected mayor there was a uh, fellow that had a typica orchestra. They didn't call them mariachis in those days. And his name was Rayo Reyes. And he had quite an orchestra, played at all the functions. And they came out on a, on a wagon with a, a kind of a flatbed trailer. With, I remember the floor of it was with a splintered kind of wood and 
it was ordinarily used, I think, for hauling hay, alfalfa bales. And uh, it was a, the way of transportation, uh, pretty special for uh, an orchestra and a, at dawn to be moving around. Of course, there was always, a, up near the driver's seat, there was always a little bottle of something to help a musician understand his music better, you know. Anyway, the streetcar was the, we lived on Nevada Street and the streetcar was on Arizona, that was one block away. And if, for instance, I wanted to to go to, to up uh, and see somebody on the Upson Avenue, like my old friend Sam Russell, why, you'd get a transfer. And I remember how you you paid your nickel and and uh, and it, you know, a slot and uh, the motorman he had to wind the thing and it would drop the nickel down in there and register the nickel, and he'd say transfer and you'd say yes, Sunset Heights, and uh, he would have in his pocket uh, a book. I remember it was usually, well, on the Arizona thing, it was kind of a dirty pink rose color. And he had, uh, on a string around his neck, he had a punch thing. And he would tear off the top uh, transfer and uh, punch it to Sunset Heights. And you kept that, and you got off at the corner of uh, Oregon and where uh, the Rio Grande came into Oregon Street, and that took you up to to Sunset Heights. And uh, that, of course, that's the way you went to town. I can remember that neither Dad nor Mother liked me. To be, uh, to get very far into San Antonio Street because there was mostly a line of saloons and there was a, a, a part of El Paso Street that's uh, well, was between San Antonio and the little plaza, the Mill Street and uh, it had a I remember it did have a saloon there, and it was opposite the Unique Theater. The Unique was was where now part of the new uh, Paso del Norte Hotel is, and they would leave the doors open. Uh, it was during the time when all the uh, National Guardsmen were here. They had about 20,000 people here when they thought they were going to enter. They had a, it was a capital I in, in the newspapers. They called it intervention. They thought they were going to intervene in Mexico. And they had all these soldiers camped at Camp Cotton. Uh, that was down there, well, at the foot of it started uh, down at, uh, at the foot of Piedra Street and all down that part of what's now, I don't know what you'd call it, it's near Escarity, that, that district of El Paso. And uh, that bunch of soldiers, of course, would get leaves not during the evening so often as, you know, they get a noon break and uh, you get to go to town and uh, hit a saloon or two. And next to the saloon across from the Unique Theater, which was only for movies, and it cost a dime to see a movie. And 
It was a great thing for us kids to go in there when the, and see when the door was open. They had some high kickers in there. The saloon part of of this establishment across from the Unique Theater was a, a place where there was always a free lunch. And I can remember the association of in my mind as, as a boy looking in there and seeing the coarse girls kicking high and the smell of beer and uh, for some reason or other frying hamburgers which they were offered at the bar and it was the very essence of sin uh, uh, which was very much disproved of by all the, the responsible temperance citizens of El Paso. But uh, the soldiers d demanded uh, some recreation from the, from the town. Although when Dad was mayor, it got a little r rough. Right along 9th Street, which is the street the, the closest to the river, uh, down in South El Paso, and, and what they called the second ward then is Chihuahuita, was uh, the line of, of uh, prostitution cribs. And the girls would stand in front of these cribs. These cribs were, oh, about eight feet wide, I don't know, a couple of blocks of them. And they'd stand in these half doors or else outside and show their petticoats and uh, our endearments to the soldiers. And uh, General Pershing was commander at Fort Bliss at that time. And, and uh, he came to dad and said, we gotta stop this. Too many cases of venereal disease, etc." So the police shut down 9th Street. It never opened again. And that just uh, put the, the girls in different parts of town, especially out oh, on Olive Street and out further east toward San Jacinta. Anyway. Was your dad a friend of General Pershing's? Yes, indeed. Uh, I remember as a boy one time, uh, General Pershing had a Sunday dinner uh, at our house and he came with his his uh, aide, who was a great guy named L Lieutenant Michaelis. And Lieutenant Michaelis invited me to come and, and spend the night in, in, in his tent down in Camp Cotton, which I did. Oh, and that was a great thing. I, uh, Dad and, and uh, Pershing, maintained their correspondence, I think, well, uh, until late in Pershing's life, long after he'd come back from the American Expeditionary Force. Uh, he was a very, very dignified man, and I never, ever heard him in my life until after his World War to have here Pershing referred to as Black Jack. If anybody had said that to him in person, I think they'd have to count for it. Uh, he was a very dignified man, and uh, he did write me one letter. I, when he got uh, uh, over in France, why Dad was writing, and he said, "Why don't you write General Pershing and wish him well?" And I did. I still have the letter. It says something about how he's sorry I wasn't a little older. He thought I'd make a good soldier. For let's see, I was about. This was in 1916. I was nine years old. You don't think that pumped me up pretty good? And of course. Kids like that, uh, then we all had soldier suits, you know, and I had a soldier hat and everything.
But to get back to early El Paso, I think that El Paso was, when I was conscious of what it was like, was perhaps a, a unique city. For instance, it, it, all the time in the, during the teens, the Mexican Revolution raged and thousands of refugees came out of Mexico, thousands were killed, and uh, the troubles, disease, and the influenza, and so on. So it was a very unsettled place, and yet very somehow tranquil. And uh, I, it seems to me that, for instance, what other city can uh, say that in uh, the 20th century, in the 1900s, there was uh, artillery fire over their city, uh, mean, and serious artillery fire. <clears throat> Two blocks from, from where I lived, 1400 Nevada, up on Golden Hill, where uh, the city treasurer of years back named Park Pittman had established a very nice home up there on the top of Golden Hill. Uh, that was uh, an emplacement for 75 millimeter field pieces uh, that the 82nd Field Artillery had uh, stationed at Fort Bliss. And uh, when uh, Villa took Juarez on uh, his last shot uh, at the border uh, in 1919, it's in June 1919, I believe, uh, we retaliated not only by sending troops over across the river, but by shelling the uh, rebel camp and uh, I was able to, to, Mr. Park Pittman let us kids in the neighborhood that all went up there to look in the, in the distance of a couple of miles to the old horse racetrack. And uh, we could see the shells hit. And I never will forget how that's the first time I ever saw a soldier killed in action was the horse racetrack, you kind of running around, and he 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 stood up. One one of the old revolutionarios stood up with his rifle and was hit and fell, and another guy appeared from I don't know where and grabbed the rifle and then started using this rifle of the other man. Makes a, an impression on a kid. I was 12 years old. Your dad had a lot of interaction with Mexican revolutionarios, and well, he. Uh, I think he was. It was partly because he was a lawyer and, and he was the mayor that he formed an office to help Victoriano Huerta, who, who came on his way back. He thought he was going to get back into the revolution after he killed, uh, or had killed, uh, Francisco Madero. Why, he uh, went to Paris uh, as a refugee. And he came back from Paris and finally to El Paso and was going to enter again with his old buddy Pascual Arrosco. But they, uh, he had a cancer of the stomach and he, uh, Victoriano Huerta did it. And, and uh, I remember dad was gone all night one night uh, and the next day. Uh, the conversation a little bit about his mother asking him about Huerta had died uh, 
oh, after midnight sometime, my dad had been there for present as, as a legal representative of his estate or whatever he had able to to get out of Mexico. So uh, that uh, he dad had a a direct contact and, and knowledge uh, of uh, Victoriano Huerta and uh, Pascual Orozco. Orozco was killed on the Love Ranch not too long after the death of, of uh, Huerta. The Love Ranch is down there below Sierra Blanca. <coughs> And uh, it, it extended down around Fort Quitman, the old ruins of Fort Quitman down there. Uh, and of course, Dad had uh, no liking at all, and it was quite mutual with Pancho Villa. And uh, he ran a Pancho Villa back across the river one time. He and Bill greet his. Chief of police went down and told me to get on the other side of the river, and they did. And uh, so Villa uh, offered a, a mil pesos resguardo oro for the, the dead or alive, the body of the. Presidente Municipal of El Paso, and uh, that proved uh, something that he couldn't get, dead or alive. So he had one of his Dorados write about every week for a few weeks, uh, threatening letters, threatening to kidnap me and my little brother Joe. And so we had a policeman that uh, would take us to school and be there waiting. There's a Lamar School down on Montana Street, a walking distance. He would walk with us to school and, and then uh, walk with us on, on our way home. And when things got real hot, and one of those times when when V had come up from Chihuahua and was taking horrors again, why a man, a policeman, uh, stayed at our house all night, every night, armed, and the mother put a, a folding army cot in the living room for him, and uh, I don't know how long he stayed awake, but. He was there every night for quite a while. Uh, Villa never came back to El Paso after that defeat he suffered in 1919. Uh, that was when uh, Felipe Angeles, who had been living here after the, the Battle of Celaya, when Obregón won, why the balance changed and Villa was no longer the big guy. Carranza was no longer the big guy, really, although Obregón was supporting Carranza at the time. Later, a little trouble down in one of the little mountain towns where they managed to knock off Carranza, just like they managed to knock off Villa outside of Peral. That was in 1921 or something. Anyway, I don't know, in describing El Paso, I, I think of, of those, all of those kind of things, but they weren't what really happened. I can think how the, the stone quarry that's at the end of, of uh, the Franklin Mountain uh, that overlooks Golden Hill and was right in our house was down uh, Wright Avenue, which was Uncle Gus Thumb, uh, one of the neighbors called it, up the gulch and down the gulch. Uh, there was always 
during the day, wagons uh, that, or dump wagons that would go up to the quarries for the, the limestone that uh, is uh, practically all foundations of El Paso of the period. And even up now, of course, it's a different quarry, but it's the same formation of limestone. And uh, these old wagons would come down, trailing down the gulch, down in front past our house, and go on down to usually to either Boulevard Street. That's Yandel used to be called Boulevard Street. A little redundancy there. And uh, we used to love to hop rides. Uh, on the back, there was a bar. Uh, it had something to do with the with the dump uh, of the bottom of the wagon. Uh, the wagon was always drawn by two pretty strong horses and very heavy because it was carrying these quarried stones, usually long, or maybe a, a foot long and a foot wide. It's, you know, they, they were roughly, they weren't uh, squared or anything. They were, and uh, the drivers hated us kids because they were responsible for the safety of the wagon and uh, uh, didn't want to get the horses to messed up, uh, hollering and yelling around and grabbing on the back of his wagon. And they, they had long whips, I remember. And you had to get down so that the back of the wagon was kind of above your head because the, the driver would pop that whip back over you, and if your head was sticking up, why, it's just too bad. That was the same with the ice wagon. I remember Consumers Ice Company, they had a team, a beautiful team of big bay horses, and uh, the ice wagon, and the man with the leather on his back, and the ice tongs, could, and he'd swing a 50-pound cue. Uh, ice, after he'd cut it with ice pick, these big stacks of ice, and, and see what uh, the housewife, uh, every house would leave a card out if she wanted 50 pounds, why well, there was a thing that said ice and 50 pounds. If she wanted only 10 pounds or 15 pounds, or if you wanted 100 pounds, if you had a big ice box or we're going to have a party and we're going to put some in a, a wash tub, why, that was another thing. Then we also, I think all the kids in the neighborhood, usually at one time or another during the summer, in those lazy days when you could sit in the shade and, and hear, oh, uh, Tito with a lawnmower hand, lawnmower buzzing along the grass and the, some neighboring lawn. And we'd all have a, a soda pop stand, which would be a, a big, uh, well, usually a lumber box and a wash tub that. You know, uh, your mother didn't like you to use much, but and you could get a dime's worth of ice and chop it up with a family ice pick and put and then order soda from the Empire Bottling Works. And cream soda was the one, and sarsaparilla were the two favorites. Uh, our parents didn't like. Uh, us to have to deal in Coca-Cola because it was supposed to contain dope. You always lived at the base of the mountain, kind of. You were, you've uh, always uh, lived. I, I, it, it's kind of. I know. Mother told me that she could look out of the window of a hotel do where 
she, I, uh, I was delivered, I remember where she stayed after my delivery, and see Mount Franklin from Hotel Du. And then we lived on Nevada Street on, in two addresses, 1316 and then 1400 Nevada Street. It was right under the mountain, always visible there, and particularly visible from my room in the north side of the house. And uh, then I went away, and when I came back, oh, I had a place on the North Stanton Street for you, on the third floor in an apartment house. And uh, there was Mount Franklin. And we used to, Sarah and I, when we were first married, used to walk a lot along Rim Road, and there was Mount Franklin. And we got the house out on Reynolds Boulevard, and right out my skylight why there was Mount Franklin and, and we moved here and we are on the side of Mount Franklin and it's a it's a kind of a thing that has been with me always and I I think it will be until the day I die hope so <laughs> when the Texas writer J Frank Doby visited Tom he said Tom, you don't even have a tree in your yard. And Tom responded, you don't have a mountain in yours. Tom wrote, Sarah and I live on the east side of our mountain. It is the sunrise side, not the sunset side. It is the side to see the day that is coming, not the side to see the day that is gone. The best day is the day coming, with the work to do, with the eyes wide open, with the heart grateful. My favorite thing about Mount Franklin is something that I read in one of the poems of Carl Sandburg, whom I've always admired as a poet and as a biographer of Abraham Lincoln. But he said uh, in one of the poems, A mountain, Carl Sandburg says, is something that's fastened down, something you can count on. By that token, a mountain is a talisman in our hearts. In looking at Mount Franklin up there, we lift our eyes toward the sky. Words from El Paso's Tom Lee. Now, the time has come, as it has each year since 1941, for you to look to the mountain as they light the stars. Carl, Carl Wilder was a good friend, and uh, Connery Bryson worked for him there at KCSM Radio, and uh, they said the electric company, they're going to light a star on the mountain for the Christmas holidays, be like a star on a tree, only this will be a star on the mountain. And we want you to say something about your feelings toward the mountain. You're a native here. And then we'll, uh, we'll turn the lights on. Uh, and we'll, the lights will stay on until after New Year's. Then after the war, why, uh, Irvin Wills, who was the head of the electric company, said, well, we'll keep it going uh, Christmas time. And uh, they did. Uh, they kept me on the program, and that's when I wrote the text that a few years later, after I had delivered the, the thing at Christmas time for several years, Carl Herzog printed a beautiful little book, uh, Old Mount Franklin, I called it. And that's how. It got recorded, and now, and now I feel sort of sad that that star is on every day, and nobody even notices it anymore. It's just a light up there on the mountain. But when it used to denote Christmas time, it seemed to me it was a much, much more significance. You know, you always, from the time you started working as an artist, you were interested in the different cultures of El Paso, you know, the Indians. 
and the Spaniards and, and the, the Anglo and, and the Mexican. And wh what was your first exposure like to the Native Americans here? Was that through your dad and his collecting of pottery or what, what kind of? Oh, I think it was my fascination with Indians was uh, uh, dad and mother and Joe and I uh, made a trip in the Buick to the Grand Canyon. And on the south rim of the Grand Canyon, there by the El Tovar Hotel, was a thing that Fred Harvey also ran called the Hopi House. And they had Hopi artifacts for sale, Hopi pottery, some beautiful pottery. And uh, uh, the Hopis were not too much on weaving blankets, but they were selling Navajo blankets and Indian artifacts. And you know, I was more fascinated than, by the Hopi house than I was by the Grand Canyon. <laughs> and uh, uh, then later when I left Chicago, I, uh, my aim was to go and live in Santa Fe. And a, a great part of that was my interest in the, in the Indian cultures. And I had uh, made drawings of some of Dad's pottery and uh, through those drawings I got a job at the Laboratory of Anthropology in Santa Fe which dealt entirely with Indian things and uh, that's where I was able to study and and uh, maintain this uh, totally amateurish interest in in the Indians and in their their, uh, I'd say, visual accomplishments, both their dances and their pottery designs. And of course, the Indians appealed to me. And of course, I was born just a couple of miles from the south bank of the Rio Grande. And from earliest recollection, with the uh, mother's helper around the house uh, and the garbage man and everybody that a little kid talks to, you know. Well, they had another language and you wanted to at least know what they were saying to you. And uh, there that was. And then the other influence, uh, the, the Anglo pioneering thing. My dad was from Missouri, but he was very, very interested in the, in the, uh, the, the history of uh, the settlement of the West and the Alamo and the Battle of San Jacinto and everything. We sat on his lap, my brother and I, and listened to the, the stories of Travis and Davy Crockett, you know, Sam Houston, all of this. So that it was, it was a kind of a, a tricultural thing that I had from the time I was a, a little boy. Tom Lee talked about people who influenced his life, one of them being Judge Ewing Thomason, his father's law partner. Well, Ewing Thomason was from East Texas. He had bad consumption. To tuberculosis and the doctor gave him a year or so to live unless he went west to a dry climate. So he came out here, he had graduated from the University of Texas Law School. He had a degree and he had a, you know, a, a permit to practice law, but he was pretty sick when he got here and uh, he had to take it real easy and he said he went to the courthouse on several days of the week just to hear what was going on because he thought that if he did live and was he wanted to live in El Paso he liked the place he liked its color and its uh, its movement and uh, 
I think she came here in 1914 or 15. Anyway, he heard Dad make some kind of wild-eyed speeches, I guess, the defending murderers or horse thieves or something. And uh, he went and introduced himself to the Dad and then told, him, told Dad about uh, the fact that he had a law degree and he'd love to practice and asked Dad how to do it. Well, Dad got interested with him and uh, yeah. so he invited him to, to belong. Dad at that time had uh, one other partner named Gideon McGrady. And he was also from East Texas and, uh, and a graduate of, oh, some some uh, more distinguished law school, uh, like Virginia or something. But he was a very rough shot old fella. And uh, he would order, I remember he'd order a suit from Sears Roebuck. He knew his size and he knew the color and he knew exactly what he wanted and, and he would, uh, he would uh, order it and it would, and, uh, it would come to the office and he would uh, put the new suit on, throw the, the old suit in the wastebasket. He never had it clean, never had it pressed. He just throw it in the wastebasket and, and, and wear this new suit until the same thing happened to it. <laughs> but he was one of Thomas later told me, he said, we had a great law firm. Uh, he said, uh, uh, your dad said, I know, the, I know the city directory pretty well for the names of jurors. And uh, I knew, this is Thomas I'm talking, I knew, what's the basic book? somebody's torts or something, not Gladstone, but something. I knew that pretty well, but Gid McGrady knew the law, and then here along came a fella named Gene Edwards, and he was from Harvard, and he said, we had one hell of a firm. <laughs> but he, uh, Thomas and then, he, he joined the firm, but he got interested in politics. And he became, first he was a member of the legislature. He, he was elected to the legislature and then they made him speaker of the house down there. And uh, he ran for governor and was defeated. Uh, but uh, a little later, this is, I guess it was 1930, was when he, ran for Congress and was elected. And he stayed in Congress for, well, until uh, Truman made him a federal judge. He was uh, the man who uh, was responsible for the making of the airport. We talked with Tom about a sarco and a painting he'd done of the smelter. That reminded him of the Mexican Revolution camps he'd seen across the river from Smelter Town when he was a child. Oh, oh yeah, that was, was the smelter. The smelter. And uh, after I was, well, it was never anything but a place you kind of stayed away from. When the first uh, Part of the revolution, you know, when Francisco Madero was staying in the Sheldon Hotel, and Villa and uh, Orozco and uh, Maximo Castillo. Incidentally, he was a client of Dad's. Dad got him out of jail on this side for smuggling. Uh, they were camped up there 
a little bit uh, upriver from where uh, La Hacienda, in, in, those, in those days it was uh, called Arts Mill, and uh, Smelter Town was built there uh, under the slag piles. And uh, our maid of many years, and the one that after mother's death that took care of little Dick, my young brother, was named Pomposa Macias, and Pomposa lived there, and was, and then later, why, uh, my good friend Urbisi Soler, the sculptor, he was brought here by the priest out there, the smelter, Father Costa, and uh, he, that made the smelter kind of. As I, know, I remember I went to Pomposa's funeral out there in the smelter and, and uh, was chided a good deal by Father Costa because I didn't climb up the crystal ray and I said, well, I was up there when Solaire was carving the statue. Ah, well, you should come and make a pilgrimage, you know. I said, well, I'm, I'm not a Catholic. Make no difference. <laughs> oh well. And the, when the, you when you were talking about then, uh, when I made that painting, uh huh. Ah, uh, that was a Sunday afternoon, and I was courting a girl by the name of Laura Lawson, and uh, we sat out there off the dirt road out there past, uh, at, at that time, uh, La Posta Motel was the, the main object uh, from Kern Place to the crossroads. There was practically nothing. And they sat out there one afternoon, and I never, I never touched anything. I never touched that, uh, when I got home, and I signed it, and when it got dry, I put a paper mat on it and gave it to Laura Lawson, and she died in California several years ago, and her kids apparently didn't know uh, care. They uh, turned it in and got a little money from us dealer there in San Francisco, and the dealer called me and asked me, you know this story, he asked me uh, what it was worth, and I told her I thought it was worth such and such. Like a year or so later we went out and I said, wonder what ever happened to that penny after Sarah and I were out there on the coast. So I called up this woman and she had kept the painting, and, she, and in her home she liked it and didn't want to sell it. And uh, I said, well, I'd like to have it. I'd like to buy it. She said, oh, I'll sell it back to you. And I said, how much? Doggone, she charged me more than I told her it was worth. And I said, I'm the painter. I ought to get a good price. No. <laughs> So that's how I got the painting back. People who would ask him what could be so special about the dried up, bare, empty country he obviously preferred to live and work in, Tom responded, first I say I was born in it, and furthermore I say I love it for the intensity of its sunlight, the clarity of its sky, the hugeness of its space, its revealed structure of naked earth's primal forms without adornment. Thank you for watching Tom Lee's El Paso.
This program is made possible in part by a grant from Humanities Texas, the state affiliate of the National Endowment for the Humanities. And by the El Paso County Historical Commission. By Maury and Jean Kemp. And by Capstone Productions, Inc. The new Tom Lee Elementary School in Northeast El Paso was under construction when it was dedicated on April 4th, 2009. There were pictures, speeches, and a groundbreaking. One, two, three. Sugar Goodman talked about what her friend Tom Lee might think about this event. I think it would have been one of his favorite honors, if not his best, because he was such a special man. And, and I'm just so happy the school board decided to name a school for him. The school continues the legacy of El Paso artist Tom Lee. Tom Lee Elementary opened for students in 2010.